I have been a technology writer for uh, more than 20 years now, um, most of that time uh, since 1994 in Silicon Valley, um, where I've uh, come from. And uh, right now I'm working for VentureBeat, which is a tech news blog uh, that uh, has about five conferences of its own, including the, the demo startup conferences. And um, in July, we're going to do our own Mobile Beat uh, and Games Beat conference uh, as well uh, for the third time. And I'm uh, very uh, glad to uh, have uh, some distinguished uh, panelists with us. And I'm, I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I, I usually can't pronounce their names. But Peter? Yeah, so um, I'm Peter Westerbacka, and uh, I'm the mighty eagle of Rovio. And uh, basically what that kind of like means is that I, I do marketing, branding, go to market, partnerships, North America, and a few other things uh, at Rovio. And uh, yeah, we made this small game called Angry Birds. So hi, good morning everybody. My name is Andre. I run a company called Outfit7. Uh, we make the Talking Friends collection series of games on the iPhone and Android. I'm the CEO of the company. Uh, sometimes, you know, they call me like he's the white eagle. I'm the chief talking person at the company. Hi, uh, I'm Ilya Lors. Uh, I'm the only guy in this panel uh, not actually making apps. I used to, but uh, today I run the uh, world's largest open app store called Getjar. And uh, today we're doing uh, approximately 100 million downloads every month, uh, and we're focusing on all platforms, uh, not just one specific. So. Probably I'm going to comment on the App Store perspective versus individual app makers perspective. Hello, everyone. I'm Igor Pushinyak, uh, running a company called Lima Sky, best known for uh, its mega hit app called Doodle Jump, uh, which my brother and I created about a year and a half ago. And uh, it's right now, according to Apple, the uh, number one top paid app of all time. Just figured would you know start. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's say that uh, Apple needs to check their numbers. <laughs> well, thank you and welcome. And um, uh, I think everybody's here because uh, this is one of the most exciting markets uh, that uh, you know, I've ever had the chance to cover, and um, that uh, the technology world has ever seen as well. And. Um, just to get you a sense of how fast it's grown, in, uh, in just two and a half years, um, Apple uh, has, as of Saturday, um, had more than 10 billion downloads of apps from the App Store. Those are free and paid apps, and it doesn't include updates either. Uh, there's more than 332,000 apps out there on, on the App Store. There's 47,000 plus games and 160 million iOS devices are on the market. Um, and they're selling at a rate of more than 40 million a quarter, almost 45 million a quarter. And those numbers are also being pretty much matched or exceeded by, by Android. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, sort of uh, uh, give you a sense of how fast uh, the rest of the growth is here by having the panelists talk about the sort of the phenomenal numbers that, that they've seen with their own growth as well. So Peter, um, tell us about Angry Birds and how, how much it has grown. Yeah, so uh, basically the latest numbers we announced uh, was in December, uh, and that was kind of like one year after we hit the App Store, and at that time uh, we hit 50 million downloads. So that's uh, paid free across all our platforms. So it's uh, iPhone, Android, Nokia, Palm, and uh, yeah, since we've done uh, quite a bit uh, more, so uh, we had a great Christmas. Uh, so uh, the numbers are now much bigger, but we're actually uh, going to announce the next set of numbers when we hit uh, 100 million and kind of get into Tetris territory. So that's like still a couple of months away. But uh, over 50 million, and uh, on the paid side, uh, it's uh, uh, way over 20 million on iPhone alone. And, and to also talk about how, what kind of cultural phenomenon it has become as well, and, and how many minutes are going into playing yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, one one thing uh, we, with Angry Birds, we also, uh, uh, of course, at, at the core, we're a game company, but uh, we also uh, really started building out the franchise. So, uh, uh, after, if you look at Angry Birds and, and kind of like the impact it has had uh, today, uh, uh, people are spending 200 million minutes playing Angry Birds. So that's every single day. And if you do the math, that's like 1.2 uh, billion hours, uh, 
of uh, Angry Birds uh, play day or million hours play day every every year. And uh, one thing uh, that's very interesting there was a Neiman uh, Institute uh, article in um, so that's like part of Harvard, and they compared uh, Angry Birds to how much people are watching TV, uh, so all of TV in the U.S. and uh, Angry Birds is uh, almost one percent of that. So we'd be very happy if we got like one percent of all the money spent on ads uh, on TV in the U.S. So kind of like that's the kind of like impact. And uh, yeah, then uh, maybe the one thing that uh, we were uh, most happy about last year was that tens of thousands of people in the U.S. dressed up as Angry Birds for Halloween. And, and that was like, uh, you know, amazing. We didn't expect that. So it's, it's these kind of things that uh, keeps one going and, and uh, look forward to kind of like having a great year this year. And we have uh, lots, lots of uh, cool new uh, stuff coming out. And Andre, you have some new numbers this morning. Yeah, we just announced this morning uh, that we surpassed the 60 million download mark in six months. We launched our first app in July, which is called Talking Tomcat. And so it's a talking series of apps, both paid and free, on Android and the iPhone. Uh, we're growing at approximately 15 million amount and uh, accelerating. Uh, One-third is coming from Android, and that is growing. Uh, the conversion from free to paid, we have a freemium model for the free apps, is over 10%. We're pretty happy with that. Uh, so we are excited about a 60 million download mark. The next one for us like is 100 million downloads that we expect to reach uh, before Q2 this year. So a really phenomenal growth. I think, you know, our companies are doing great, but also Apple and Android are growing tremendously fast. Their run rate, as uh, Dean said, is 45 million iOS devices a quarter. That naturally, you know, or expands our markets. So this year is going to be very interesting. We think as of it as a breakout year in terms of the inflection point of adoption of uh, smartphone devices. We're very excited to be part of this ecosystem. Uh, in terms of markets, 45-50% UK, US, uh, one-third Europe. Very interestingly, Korea, China for us, number five and number six. So we've seen a lot of activity uh, in those markets. Uh, really, really interesting. Uh, daily activity, you know, it's a lot. We're going to announce a number very soon. Kids, you know, tend to poke. I mean, this T-shirt is very dangerous. When a, a, child, uh, a kid sees me, he wants to poke in my T-shirt because he can poke the cat. So that's it, thanks. And uh, how big is Getcher getting now? Yeah, well, Getcher is doing very well nowadays. And, uh, you know, recently we also saw a pretty big uh, rise of Android. And uh, when we launched uh, Angry Birds on Android, uh, we saw over 1 million downloads in the very first day. So uh, it's been, you know, probably the, uh, the biggest application ever. And they, they brought down the store for a little while too, right? Oh, uh, well. <laughs> It's just uh, a little bit unexpected, let's put it this high of a number. But uh, yeah, it restarted pretty soon and it's uh, doing really well. Uh, you know, again, the one comment I wanted to make a little bit is, uh, you know, although apparently our business started as content business, so uh, initially apps were, uh, you know, just like an you know, MP3 song as a consumable content. Uh, right now, you know, what we observe again on this space is that apps much uh, more becoming like a media, uh, you know, media containers. And this whole paradigm of using, say, the web URL to access services is changing uh, to such an app service. So no longer really type Facebook uh, to get there. You just like press a little blue F button. So uh, you know that's like really, really you know interesting to see you know how apps uh, say uh, are very resembling of you know how the web was uh, 20 years ago when you know everybody was moving on the web every business migrated every media migrated and you know everybody established their web presence so uh, you know we see the same process going right now everybody you know apparently establishes their app presence and uh, you know I think that all these content hits you know like 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 Angry Birds and you know all the guys around me it's, it's really great because it, it really helps to validate the media and to attract uh, you know all the businesses and attention to that media and Igor, how about some of your numbers? Yeah. That's well, we haven't actually released any numbers in okay. a while, and uh, I'm not going to announce any numbers today. Um, one of the things that we don't have is the, uh, a very sophisticated analytics system that will actually tell us the number of hours that people play Doodle Jump or 
um, the number of minutes spent on falling down from all the platforms. But what we do have is we have emails from our fans, and I just got one um, yesterday from a from a father of a five-year-old who had a great suggestion for the game and really needed um, to send it out to us. Now, Apple did has... Get, did you get a letter from my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, so, I mean, App, Apple has recently released the, uh, the rankings of all the apps, um, and uh, according to Apple's numbers, Doodle Jump is the number one top paid app in the United States and uh, Germany as well, since we're here, and a few other countries. So uh, we are very proud of that, especially because the team behind Doodle Jump is really my brother and myself, and um, that's pretty much it. Uh, we are, uh, Doodle Jump is available on Android and uh, a lot of other mobile platforms through uh, our partner or our licensee game house, and um, it's a paid app right now. Uh, we're looking at the great success that Angry Birds has had with a free version um, on Android, and that might be a direction that we're going in. Mm -hmm. That makes me think of the, uh, the uh, Robert Ney, who's a 14-year-old boy in uh, Utah, uh, who created uh, and launched his own uh, uh, game on the App Store called uh, uh, Bubble Ball on December 29th. And uh, I think last Friday, um, uh, they knocked uh, Angry Birds Seasons out of the uh, number one free spot in the in the App Store. Um, you know that's uh, astounding that uh, a 14 year old kid working with his mother and um, and some developer tools uh, uh, can submit a, an app for three hundred dollars and and go to number one. Um, what does that make you guys think about? Um, By the way, there's a new news uh, mm -hmm. of a 12 year old guy uh -huh. just two days ago. <laughs> uh -huh. And we had that four-year-old design level for us. <laughs> so, so, so uh, you guys going to hire this 14-year-old kid? Or? Uh, but I, I think that that was uh, kind of like uh, you know brilliant marketing and PR and, and all of that. So that's great. But it's also actually the, what's what's really at the core of that, and and that's actually what we are very happy about. I mean, if you look at Rovio, we've been in business since 2003. So Angry Birds wasn't like an overnight uh, success, or let's say Rovio as a company. We uh, we made uh, 51 games before Angry Birds, and then you know Angry Birds is our 52nd game. So it's it's not like uh, you know, made a game you know uh, overnight or you know like uh, then su uh, submitted it and, and became a huge success. So it's it's a lot of hard work, and uh, of course sometimes you know some people you get lucky and and, and all of that. But uh, I, I think that uh, if you look at what Apple uh, in particular has done and the App Store has done is that it has really made these kind of things possible that you know now a 14 year old or anybody that can uh, write some code can submit an app, app. and uh, i bet for you know like that 14 year old that was in the news that got his app to the number uh, one spot there's you know a hundred or a thousand other 14 year olds that have done the same and they didn't hit number one so so uh, uh, it's not um, that easy, but of course it's a story that you know everybody uh, loves that you can make that happen, and uh, that's the big change. That if you go a few years back, there was no way that could have happened. That 14 year old could have gone to Verizon and said that, "Hey, I have this great game. Why don't you put it on your deck?" And first of all, they wouldn't have even talked to him. He would never have gotten to Verizon. He would probably like, call the call center like a couple of times, and then you know, like forgot about it. So. Uh, now, because of the app stores, anybody can at least get their app out there. And now you have to make great games. So we're not in this uh, old like Soviet style system of the carriers deciding what's good for us. But it's actually like good games sell. It's interesting that all of you are pretty much in positions at Electronic Arts, which uh, has been a huge video game company since 1982, um, w would love to have in, in the market. Uh, you know, the, They've got lots of brands, um, and yet uh, 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 you guys are in positions that uh, make electronic arts uh, look bad sometimes. Any comments? <laughs> uh, well, Sorry. I can comment on that. So one of the one of the things that many of the big gaming companies that have been around for a long time have not realized early on is that the app store market is very different from what they've been used to. 
um, electronic arts and other big companies have been used to putting out packaged products, basically work on a big release, big game, put it out on the shelves, sell it and forget about it in some way and then move on to the next project. App Store has been very much about content updates, very much like websites, very much like TV series. You have to keep on adding new content for your apps to actually be interesting to people and for, the, for your users to actually go back to them. Imagine a website that never changes the content. And uh, those were initially the games from some of the bigger companies. They're catching up and they're um, realizing that and a lot, of, a lot has changed, but I think the momentum that smaller companies like ours have uh, been able to obtain is still, um, still leading the way. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's ultimately where uh, they weren't right on the spot early on. Ilya? Yeah. Yeah, I want to comment a little bit specifically that uh, question from the App Store perspective, and I think that, you know, apparently the one thing that App Store's fundamentally changed is uh, marketing for application. Because uh, by virtue of being on an App Store, uh, again, depending on who you are, you know, how good you are, you receive or you don't receive marketing, uh, you know, which is often referred to as a top chart. Mm -hmm. And the trick here is that uh, you get to the top because you're good not because you've spent like zillions on, on like you know, promoting on TV or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So uh, App Store's really leveled the whole field and uh, App Store algorithms are good enough to recognize the content which is great mm -hmm. and uh, the whole popularity or say success of a game is not dependent that much mm -hmm. uh, on the marketing. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's, it's, it's very fair to small developers to have this model because no longer you really have to, you know, compete uh, for visibility or for mind share, uh, you know, with really, really big companies. You know, by the way, you know, uh, I used to produce mobile games myself, you know, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to wait till the time when you know, games really became big, so I shifted to App Store in 2004. Uh, but at that time, 2004, you know, really a big frustration from a small developer like we were, uh, was that carriers, not only they would not talk to 14 years old guy, they would not talk in fact to anybody unless you have like, you know, Spider-Man license or, I know, like Batman or something like really big that only EA could afford. So the big frustration for me was, you know, the quality of the games we produced at that time was, was outstanding compared to what I call these splash screens. Mm -hmm. Because essentially, you know, what these guys would be selling you in those days is, you know, a nice colorful splash screen, you know, of Ice Age. But, you know, as content, as, as game, as, as gameplay engagement, you know, all this stuff, uh, uh, really sucked. So uh, I think that's, that's the, one of the big reasons that, <clears throat> you know, this whole marketing model, uh, which is able to recognize good versus, uh, uh, you know, spending, is really great and fair to everybody. Developers first, but, you know, consumers apparently as well. And talk a little bit about your uh, business model too, because uh, discovery is the problem that the, the App Store has. And, you know, we're, we're moving from the analogy of one store now to many shopping malls in a, a city full of shopping malls, I guess, right? And uh, uh, finding the app that you want uh, or getting your app um, enough attention uh, seems to be the, the big problem. And you guys have addressed that, right? Yes, uh, uh, well, you know, the, uh, essentially the problem looks pretty much similar, you know, the way I compare it to parking in city center. There is 100 parking lots in the city center. There is 1,000 vehicles who want to park in that city center. So uh, what do you do as a city? You know, funny enough, uh, uh, they introduce a paid model, a paid parking model. First, they allocate the spots to vehicles that deserve parking, right? So the residents, and then, you know, the uh, uh, disabled people and so on. So uh, in our model, we recognize the best ones. So if application is great, just as Google, you know, in the generic index, we're able to recognize something which is good and we bring it in the generic index. But for the rest, it's market that regulates visibility. If you want to buy specific, what we call the sponsored slot, and again, just, just as you would buy a sponsored slot in Google search, which is approximately like 20% of the screen, you can. And it operates on purely transparent auction principle. So you want more visibility, uh, you realize that basically you have to compete for the same space with everybody else. So uh, simply you bid more. 
and depending how strong you are and how strong is your business model, uh, you can buy more visibility. So that is our model. Again, it's you know funny enough, it operates exactly the same as Google Search, where you see the generic search index. You know, so that would be our same main listing, where you get because you're good. Uh, uh, or uh, if you want to buy premium visibility, or you're welcome to buy site place, which is approximately 20% of our property on an auction basis. So uh, again, just as you know, market regulates supply and demand in real life. I know in city parking uh, space, uh, you know, that's exactly how we started to regulate uh, supply and demand for visibility, for discoverability in the app store space. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to your question mm -hmm. uh, very briefly. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not only marketing that the app economy fixed, but it's discovery, distribution, monetization, and consumption. And those were inefficiencies of the old web model. So I think it's really not one distribution channel, but it's a paradigm shift that is gonna to touch industries across the board. Not only gaming, but any industry will be impacted by the new distribution model. If you think about the app, it's like a building block. It's a very contained experience that the user can discover and then interact with within seconds. And I think with the proliferation of smartphones and app stores, we're gonna see like a major, I think, paradigm shift across the board. For example, in our case, we we weren't really sure what we are doing. We weren't, we weren't a gaming company. We are providing an, an experience which is open-ended for people to play again and again. And then we observe kids, how they play with it. And then we said, wait a minute, we are basically a toy company. We are competing with the Mattels and the Hasbro's of the world. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they sold one billion Barbie dolls since their launch in 58, so over 50 years. I think we can ship one billion talking tomcats Mm -hmm. within less than a couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. So I think really what we're seeing is, you know, game companies competing with, you know, traditional game companies and their business hasn't been really disrupted in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna see, I think, new and new companies that are just using the distribution channel and the level, uh, the playing field is leveled right now mm -hmm. to touch their, you know, disrupt their businesses. So I, I think we've done a good job getting people excited about mobile games, but um, we, we should bring it down to earth a little too, right? Uh, uh, there's a lot of hype associated uh, with mobile games right now. And um, if, if you look at something like um, DNA, a Japanese um, mobile game company bought uh, NGMoco for $403 million with, with all the earnouts. And uh, at the day that that happened, they, they said they had 50 million minutes of usage a game or a day for NGMoco's games. And uh, right now, um, your one game is four times that. And I guess that means that your company is valued at $1.6 billion. Uh, sounds about right, but uh, actually yeah. it's speed on the low side. <laughs> but. Um, but again, you know, the, the revenues and profits in this industry, I think NGMoco's um, uh, was purchased for 13 times uh, its uh, uh, revenues. And uh, that's pretty astounding as far as the price goes and reflects some of the, the hype in the mar market now. Um, so uh, when do you think the, the revenues and profits in this industry are gonna catch up with some of the hype? I think they already are. I mean, we're insanely profitable on our side. So, so I mean, I guess that's one thing that uh, compared to some of the ac other acquisitions that we're actually making money. So we uh, probably should start losing money to kind of like boost our valuation even more. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that of course there's there's some hype and it's always, uh, uh, you know, especially when you start talking about things like valuation. I mean, there's no right valuation until kind of like you have money on the table and you like, the, the papers are signed, so, so I, I think that, that you can always speculate. Uh, but I, I think uh, uh, DNA acquiring NGMoco, I, I think that it's, uh, again, uh, uh, there are many reasons why that probably makes sense from uh, their perspective, but uh, all of these deals are uh, kind of like done for, uh, for their own reasons. And, and of course for DNA, they're extremely successful in Japan and they want to establish uh, you know, presence uh, in the rest of the world as well, so, so there, there's reasons for that. Uh, but but if, we, if you look at uh, the mobile uh, market and, and uh, the mobile games market in particular, I think that it's, uh, uh, sure there's some hype, but I, I think it's, it's actually in, in a pretty healthy state and, and there's lots of people making lots of money, so it's, it's also, uh, it's, a, it's a good business. And uh, just on this kind of like, uh, 
you know, I, I think that, you know, like transformation that, okay, comparing, uh, you know, looking at toy companies and, and uh, other industries, that there is a lot of this kind of like disruption going on. And, and I think that a lot of the established players, uh, you know, if you shipped, you know, like uh, a billion Barbie dolls or whatever over the years, uh, you know, it doesn't make you great in, in this kind of like new distribution digital distribution and I think it's the same that we've seen with music, with the movies, we're now seeing with games and uh, I mean it's not a new thing, the same thing happened you know to the dinosaurs, the small furry animals inherited the planet so uh, happy to be a small furry animal right now or like an angry bird. Others want to weigh in on that? No, I agree with you. I mean, it's definitely not inflated. I think we're going to see tremendous growth for all our companies within this next year. Actually, there's going to be an inflection point. So we're going to see a network effect where you know, our, our companies will start to grow exponentially by the end of this year. Uh, we announced, uh, we usually don't announce revenue numbers, but for Christmas Day, we uh, exceeded 1 million downloads and we made over $200,000 on one day. So it's not inflated. There is real money in the App Store economy. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit on a global basis, uh, you know, if you look at the app industry as a whole, uh, uh, there has been produced at least uh, three independent researches on estimating the value of the app space and uh, you will find numbers anywhere between 30 and 50 billion dollars in just the next three years. Right. You know, of course, I can like you know go into individual assumptions and you know, know how do you make it to this number, but just you know to give you a sense of scale, that's twice as much as the whole of the music industry is making, mm -hmm. right? So uh, and you know you know how profitable and and, and big music industry is with all you know rock stars and you know label companies, uh, you know all these guys. So basically, these are the equivalent of rock stars in the uh, up world. But uh, you know I wanted to drill on two specific uh, aspects. Uh, that unfortunately make the transition somewhat slow. So, uh, Peter, you mentioned that you know you would be happy to have one percent of TV ad revenue. Uh, it, or actually, let's say that that's a good start. <laughs> that's a good start. Yeah, that's that's great. But uh, you know, so there are two sources of money, only two, that eventually come into the space uh, outside the shell. I mean, I I'm not taking into account any recycling within the space. So, one apparent source is consumers buying either services or products or content within the whole economy. And the other source is apparently advertising dollars moving from outer the space, you know, Nike and Adidas and you know, TV or any other media money going into the space. Advertising and consumer spend. Now, consumer spend is extremely restricted today by lack of uh, working even good enough billing platform beyond iPhone. So, uh, you know, as, as, as Peter would agree with me, uh, outside the iPhone, no, everybody would agree with me. For example, in the on Android today, essentially cannot sell content because checkout as a billing platform simply does not work. I mean, uh, so unless that is fixed, unless billing is fixed, uh, you know, simply processing transactions from consumers, you know, the industry taking uh, forward its owed to it for the value it produced uh, will be extremely difficult. And payments, unfortunately, is a very, very sensitive and complex area. So fixing that space will take 10 years. That's, that's, that's a big time form. Now, if you look at the advertising part of the equation, uh, I would say right now the industry is spending uh, only 1% of the capacity on mobile because uh, advertising spend is extremely slow to move. For example, I know I read last year a very interesting research. If you conditionally accept, uh, say, uh, TV, uh, say, one unit of attention versus one unit of uh, money spent on print, TV, web, and mobile, so uh, you would basically find out that on TV, say for 100 units of attention measured by minutes or by hours, essentially you have like 100 units of spend. So that's the level. It's basically at full capacity. Take it as is basically as, you know, as, as, as a, a given. Now, internet, for the 100 units of mind share, you will find only 10 units of spend, right? So it took 15 years for the web to essentially monetize 10% of the capacity on advertising. For mobile, it's 1%. Mm -hmm. So why it is so? If you analyze you know, on a global scale uh, advertising spend, uh, primarily it's driven by big brands, mm -hmm. you know, Coca-Cola money and you know, Nike money and these guys. And this spend is controlled by agencies. These agencies uh, are planning campaigns like five years ahead. They operate under principles uh, that are like 10, 15 years old. So if you ask you know, many of the digital agencies that control the spend of you know, this, this, this big companies, 
they will not even be able to find, a, a, you know, or agree on a framework, you know, how to measure engagement, how to measure consumer impact, how to measure, uh, you know, anything about it. So our experience is that advertising on a global scale moves very slowly. So it will be another 10 years until mobile is at 10 percent capacity. Probably it will be about like 20 years until mobile receives really fully what it's own. So although the perspective is bright, you know, the, the, the processes are pretty slow. Great. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, uh, do we have a microphone out there too? Um, uh, right, right out there. Um, Hi, good morning. Could you address uh, virtual good monetization in uh, ap applications um, and what you think the timing is and the evidence for your predicted timing? I, I think you talked about 10 years for payment systems. So is it your view 10 years from now? Yeah, so essentially, uh, yeah. anybody welcome to comment, but essentially you know, in terms of monetization, uh, you know, we're looking at the say four fundamental business models that exist today. So uh, paid application is one. Uh, ad supported is two, uh, subscriptions is three, and uh, virtual goods or virtual economy is four. So the way you know, I typically uh, say look at you know, which business model is right for which type of application, uh, uh, I apply what I call the US model. Uh, nothing to do with US centric view of the world, sorry. <laughs> but it's basically utility versus stickiness. So uh, if your application has high utility, uh, I mean, for example, Angry Birds, you really enjoy playing it. So then you're prepared to pay. So uh, a paid model is right for you. Now, stickiness is very stuff because too often actually games miss stickiness. Generally, you know, our observation is that you play a game for two, three minutes, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes, and then you never ever play the game. So generally, games generally, except, you know, Angry Birds guys, are example where, uh, you know, you only play a little bit, but you enjoy it a lot. If therefore you're willing to pay. So advertising, for example, is not suitable for that model because uh, you simply don't generate enough screen views uh, uh, to generate any sufficient revenue from advertising. So now, totally the opposite, if you have low utility, high stickiness, then uh, you can uh, apply advertising because on the one hand, the consumer will not be prepared to pay money because of the you know, low utility. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of stickiness, which means a lot of opportunities to show ads, generate you enough uh, uh, say viewership base to earn significant revenue from uh, uh, advertising revenue. Example is would be a Weber application. You know, you don't really prepare to pay for a Weber application, but you check it out every day. So advertising is the you know, best example for these kind of apps. Now, if you're lucky to have both engagement, utility, and stickiness, then you can run subscriptions or virtual goods. And you know, this is what you know Zynga guys are doing, and uh, you know all the social games. So yes. Uh, you are willing to pay because you have high social engagement. Uh, on the other hand, you know you come like every single day, so uh, they can uh, charge you on ongoing basis. Okay. Other questions in the back there? Okay. Yeah, right behind you. Right there. Good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, could you address the topic of Android because Apple and App Store is very structured and relative easy for marketeers, but w what will be facing with, with Android? Yeah, would someone like to sort of quickly rattle off the, the challenges on an Android as well? Yeah, it's, uh, it, I, I think that it's very important like, uh, to, when you look at uh, the iOS and the Apple ecosystem, and then you uh, and you start there. It's it's very simple, and you can like deal with Apple, and, and that's it. Uh, in Android, it's uh, it's different. So so it, it's uh, always get this question that okay, is it you know like better or worse uh, and and all that. But I, I think that you just have to understand that it's different. So people uh, don't really pay for content, at least not currently, and and there's many reasons for that. Then there's multiple storefronts, so uh, every carrier in the world is or pretty much. Uh, Building their own, uh, so so it's getting a bit fragmented on the on kind of like the ecosystem side. And there are so, 20 Android uh, markets in in China among the carriers. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So there's lots of different markets, and of course, uh, uh, kind of like the the first thing that you notice that there's lots of different devices. But uh, 
uh, that's nothing new in mobile. We always had fragmentation with, you know, like the J2ME and brew time. So uh, it's actually compared to that Android is uh, trivial from a fragmentation perspective. But it's, it's just that uh, uh, don't think that it's going to be the same as, as iPhone. I think that's kind of like the most important message there. I think traditionally uh, the uh, mobile game companies would hire 300 people to do ports of... Uh, of their yeah. games to different platforms, and uh, that's how they solved that problem in the past. But yeah, advertising works great on that side, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, others, questions? Uh, yep. uh, Hi, guys. Hey. Yeah. Um, so given where HTML5 is going, talk a little bit about where you see the future of mobile web apps versus closed native apps, or, and also hybrid approaches. Yeah, and uh, we'll have everything. So it's, it's not going to be either or. And th this has been kind of like uh, this uh, discussion that's been going on like forever. Is it, you know, like uh, native apps, web apps, uh, whatever. And I, I think that uh, from a user, and you should start from a user's pers perspective uh, here as well, so that you, whatever it takes to provide a great experience. So, so I think that's, that's kind of like the starting point. And today, it's, it's, uh, uh, for, for a lot of games, you just have to do native. But I, I think that... Uh, uh, I mean, we're doing, doing stuff uh, with HTML5, uh, you know, on our side as well, and, and we can provide some great experiences there, but they're just uh, different from what, we, what we're doing with Angry Birds currently. So, so it's, it's uh, whatever it takes to uh, make your end users uh, extremely happy. Other question? What's the role and future of brands? And, um, and at the same side, um, what's the future of advertisement? Because um, today, it can, or I think it, it can be banners, actually. So what's next? What do you think? Let's get one favorite? of you to answer that. So I think, you know, first of all, I think the brands have an amazing opportunity right now to engage the audiences on a very, very different level and, and re-engage that audience. And, uh, and we're going to see, I think, this year a lot of interesting experiments for, for, for very large brands. And we've also seen already that uh, they can distribute and acquire users uh, on these platforms, on the mobile platforms, through an app distribution channel on a very efficient basis. And some of the experiments proved very successful. So I think we're going to see a lot of that. So I think brands are going to eventually really move to a more engaging uh, model of uh, communicating and, and, in, in, and interacting with their target markets uh, across the board in thinking in very different genres and verticals from games to utilities, entertainment, and so on. Peter wants to Yeah, just one, what I wanted to add there is, is that what we are starting to see now, and, and this is something that we've been talking, uh, you know, at mobile industry forever, is, is that, uh, you know, it, it, that's really the center of gravity if you look at the uh, world right now, and especially like in, in gaming, center of gravity is in, in mobile. And what we start to see is that the brands are now also starting to emerge and, and there are new brands coming from mobile going elsewhere. And what we're doing with Angry Birds is, okay, we start a mobile, we're going on all the platforms, consoles, PCs, Macs, TV, movies, toys, everywhere. And I think that we'll see a lot more of that because people really, really engage with what we are doing, with other people are doing on the mobile platform. And that's something that's... Uh, totally unheard of before. And I think and you've, you've mentioned that uh, people are doing more searches for Angry Birds than for Mickey Mouse? Yeah, I mean, so, so there's, uh, people are engaging a lot more with uh, Angry Birds currently than they are with Mickey Mouse. So, so it's, it's, it's again, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a good start. And I think that we will see more and more of that, but also the speed. Angry Birds hit a year ago. And now when I walk around in the US wearing this, and I mean even here, people recognize the brand. So you can build a household brand for next to nothing right. in a year. We didn't have, you know, like when you look at the big Hollywood studios, when they do a movie, it costs 400 million and four years to make. The reason it costs 400 million is that they spend 100 or 200 million on advertising, brute force. When there's a new blockbuster movie out, you will know about it. Why? Because there's 100 million spent on the, all the billboards, the TV, everything. And even if the movie sucks, a lot of people will go and see it. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, just uh, a, a couple of words for each person here, starting with Igor. Um, what's your prediction for 2011 in this space? I, I just try to stay away from making predictions because they just make you look silly um, <laughs> after uh, you know, they don't come true. But one, you know, one thing that we'll certainly see is growth, 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 as everyone has um, said and commented. And many have observed double growth from 2009 to 2010 Christmas season, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see like three times the, the traffic and at the end of this year. Ilya? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think like, one of the big uh, platform shifts uh, this year is apparently going to be Android becoming uh, bigger than the iOS. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's probably going to be very, very fragmented, so it will be very difficult to cope with it, but that will happen in terms of actual numbers. And the network can show, uh, I would second the uh, absolute growth of the market. So as I said, like last year, a successful app developer would feel okay making tens of millions of dollars. This year, it's really like hundreds of millions of dollars. So 10x growth in one year in terms of measure of success, I think it's very significant. Andre? Yeah, adding to that, I think we're gonna see an inflection point and agree, you know, end of this year, we may see not a 3x, but a 10x. Peter? Yeah, uh, I, I don't mind looking silly, so uh, let's uh, let's make some crazy prediction. But yeah, I, I think that uh, that uh, we'll probably see uh, the first apps hit uh, half a billion downloads. All right, we're out of time. Thank you very much.